Good morning, WTO movers and shakers. Can you gather around the stage? I want to welcome you all to the opening of our WTO 20th anniversary commemoration. <laughs> Uh, as we get underway this morning, I'd like to recognize that we're gathering um, on the territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. Uh, we thank them for their hospitality and for the continual use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Yeah. We're here today because on November 30, 1999, thousands of protesters were in the streets here in Seattle to shut down the World Trade Organization. Uh, the Washington Fair Trade Coalition was born out of those protests in 99, and we continue to mobilize many of the uncommon alliances that were made there at the protests. Our coalition is made up of 60 Washington State labor, faith, environmental, food justice, public health, student, small farmer, and other social justice groups that are committed to creating a fair, balanced, and sustainable global trading system. And since 1999, we continue to stand together because we know that we're stronger when we stand together. It's a tool of people in power to try to divide us in challenging times instead of uniting us around solutions. So today we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the battle in Seattle when people rose up and stood up for something big and important, a fair and just economic system that benefits all of us. I wanted to make a couple of logistical notes quick. Um, there are folks gathering um, signatures for the Duwamish tribe and their federal recognition. They're holding clipboards, please find them and sign the petition. Um, additionally, doing the work that we do for WFTC requires financial support from folks like you who care about trade policy. And over in the w WFTC tent, there's a little donation box and we would love for folks to give what they can. Um, additionally, there are folks that have maps and there are maps also in the tent that will help you get from here to Town Hall if you're planning on coming to the workshops. And then last, I wanted to note um, that a little bit later in the program, there are some folks who are part of a marching band in 1999 that will also be joining us. So, yay. <laughs> On November 30th, Seattleites woke up to this huge banner um, hanging from a crane. For folks who maybe had no idea what the WTO was, uh, this banner at least gave them the impression that morning that the WTO was not working in their favor. Uh, with that, I'm going to start introducing our speakers for the morning. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing Lori Wallach. She's the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, a 25-year veteran uh, of congressional trade battles, starting with the 1990s fight over NAFTA. She was named to Politico's 50 list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics for her leadership in the Trans-Pacific Partnership debate. Wallach is an internationally recognized expert on trade with experience advocating in Congress, foreign parliaments, trade negotiations, courts, government agencies, the media, and in the streets. <laughs> okay, please join me in welcoming Lori Wallach. Thank you. Good morning, friends. Isn't this morning a little bit like one, 20 years, seven days, and it would have been four hours earlier when people came out to the streets in the most beautiful coordinated resistance and the allegedly unstoppable force of corporate globalization hit the truly immovable object of popular democracy and history was made. So, after an entire year of educating, strategizing, training, plotting, advocating, agitating, the sun came up in a cold, rainy morning like this in Seattle. And the United States, the popular resistance in the United States, signaled to the whole rest of the world that we, too, wanted a different kind of world and economy that put people on the planet first and that we were not for the corporate-led globalization of the WTO. The impact of that work on the, suite, on the streets changed what happened in the suites during Seattle's ministerial. Many negotiators 
because I was in and out and in and out, told me that it was news to them, that here in the belly of the beast, a lot of people didn't want this thing that they had been fighting and fighting and fighting since before its creation. And the enzymatic effect of the inside and the outside that day in Seattle led to negotiators from the Caribbean, from Latin America, from Africa saying, basta, no, we are not signing on to WTO expansion. And their governments have been fighting it in Geneva for years. And then with our brothers and sisters in Cancun, in Hong Kong, in Geneva, battles in those ministerial meetings in the capitals of numerous countries, very brave negotiators in the suites in Geneva fighting, people power stopped the WTO expansion. And that is an amazing effing accomplishment. Because all the most powerful corporations in the world were for it, the people were against it. Our chant was no new round, turn around. So we got the no new round. But brothers and sisters, we still have a lot of work to do on the turnaround. For the WTO itself, it's in a crisis. But unfortunately, the WTO is not an accountable body. The work we all need to do is with each of our governments. So here in the US, we have to make sure we have a majority in Congress. That makes it impossible to have the bad agreements. And we have to have a majority in Congress and a president who wants the kind of progressive alternatives for the global economy that can get the benefits of trade, but that are good for people and for the planet, not just for the big corporations. And that's our work going forward. The WTO is not going to change unless its member countries make it. Right now, they're plotting to try and expand the remit again. Get this one. The agenda for the next ministerial is to try and start negotiations to handcuff governments from setting any regulations on the big, gigantic online platforms. Google and its invasions of our privacy, Amazon, yes, I know where I am, and its monopolization and crushing of small businesses. The idea right now for the next negotiation is, is it turnaround? No, it's expand again and expand for the big online platform giants to screw people around the world. So our work is to continue to educate, to organize, to agitate from the bottom up, country by country. And we have brothers and sisters in dozens of other countries who are our partners in our world is not for sale, the global WTO coalition, who just met with a strategy meeting and who are working in each of their countries. And we're part of that movement. And with our brothers and sisters around the world, we will force the just rules that people stood up bravely against power, against police brutality, against freezing their butts off in a day even colder than today. And from Seattle in those 20 years, our work on the turnaround proceeds. And I look forward to an anniversary sometime soon where we actually have not just the no new round, but the turnaround. Thank you all. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lori. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Robin Everett and Ahmed Gaia, and they would like to request that anyone with a turtle costume come join them on the stage. <laughs> Robin has been an organizer for 12 years, and she's currently the organizing manager for Sierra Club in Washington. Everett has been an, or an environmental leader in the fight against the Trans-Pacific Partnership and is working with labor to figure out what a just transition really looks like. Ahmed Gaia is the national field organizer for the Sunrise Movement, an army of young people fighting to stop the climate crisis and create millions of good jobs. Over the past decade, Ahmed has run campaigns for social and environmental justice in the US, Canada, and Europe. Please join me in welcoming Robin and Ahmed to the stage. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh, yeah, I'll be at the short one. That makes sense. <laughs> So, like she said, I'm Robin and this is Ahmed, and we're here representing Teamsters and Turtles to the Green New Deal, um, being the old guard and the new guard of a em just environmental movement. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of history of, you know, the protests were two days and the first day was actually deemed a health and environmental day. And my old boss was um, part of the organizing crew that helped organize um, almost 5,000 people for a tea party rally. 
Um, we had Paul Well Senator Paul Wellstone. We had USW giant Leo Gerard, and we had um, the former Sierra Club director uh, David Brower speaking. And that is actually where the Teamsters to Turtles legend began. Was at that rally. Um, the people, this was an amazing time for the movement. Um, before the WTO, labor and environment really didn't work together, really didn't talk to each other very much. And this rally fundamentally changed that and began what is known now as the Blue-Green Alliance um, in really working together to protect our democracy and put our, put our, you know, our fights aside when, um, when it really matters, when we really need to stand up to big corporations. Um, a former trade organizer for the Sierra Club was quoted in the Baltimore Sun saying that the bonding on the floor of that stadium created a progressive coalition in Seattle, the likes of which have never been seen, and that will fundamentally change the future of trade politics in America and around the world. When you have Jimmy Hoffa talking repeatedly and passionately about the environment, you have a shift in attitude. <laughs> and the next day we joined our brothers and sisters in the AFL-CIO and many, many, many organizations. 35,000 people marched on the streets. And this was all done with flip phones and no social media. <laughs> um, Carl Pope, our executive director at the time said, you know, the WTO will never be able to put back the pieces together. It'll be hard to resurrect the process. The concept of world trade rules in which large multinational conglomerates decide 80% of what goes on and everybody else gets the remaining 20% is finished. I like to think the Sierra Club is right about a lot of things. Unfortunately, we got that one wrong. Um, while, yes, we fundamentally changed the way the WTO worked, we scared the shit out of them, really, and now they work in secret, our trade laws still don't represent us. They do not represent the environment, and they do not represent workers. And unfortunately, for all the promises Donald Trump gave on trade, his NAFTA 2.0 fails to remedy most of what um, we consider the worst environmental threats, continuing to outsource our pollution and our jobs and offer special handouts for notorious polluters like Exxon and Chevron. Um, this deal doesn't even mention climate change. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said, any changes to NAFTA must put America's families to work and recognize the fundamental connection between commerce and climate. And we better hold her to that. Hey everybody, so once again, my name is Ahmed and I'm with the Sunrise Movement. For those, if some of you know who we are. Oh, for those of you who don't, we are building an army of young people to stop the climate crisis and create millions of good jobs fighting for the Green New Deal as the vehicle to do that. Uh, a lot of our members were born after the WTO <laughs> protests and most of our leadership. But that doesn't mean that what happened in Seattle 20 years ago hasn't profoundly impacted the fights that we're having today. I grew up on the East Coast in New York. I was 13 when the WTO came to Seattle. And when, I, when that happened, I didn't know, I remember distinctly not knowing what the WTO was, but I remember being in middle school and knowing that whatever it was, it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> um, and that echoed across the country. And the legacy of the work that was done here has impacted the generation that is rising up today profoundly and unchangeably. 20 years ago, the idea that a healthy planet, a just economy, and a fair society were fundamentally interconnected. And our struggles were fundamentally interconnected. And the solutions to the problems we faced were fundamentally interconnected was a radical idea that took many, many hours and years and weeks of meetings to get folks on the same page around. For today's generation that is rising up, it's common sense. And it's the fundamental principle on which we act. Uh, and so that is a legacy that even for folks who might never have heard of what happened in Seattle 20 years ago, because they were only born 15 years ago and are organizing, or yesterday, walked out of their high schools or walked Woo! out of their colleges, who got arrested in Massachusetts, in North Carolina, in Iowa, demanding a fair economy and a healthy planet. The legacy that happened to hear fundamentally impacted their worldview and the way that they're taking on the mantle of this movement. And we have to say a profound thank you to everybody who took up that up. And the WTO was a f the fight against for global justice. The fight against the WTO was a fundamentally international fight. 
and the fight for a Green New Deal, while it's been framed predominantly here in the United States, and the global youth uprising happening today is also an international fight. Young people around the world, not only in the global north, but in my home country, in Pakistan, last year there wasn't a climate movement. On September 20th, hundreds of thousands of people marched in the streets of major cities, led by young people across the world. Next week, young people have forced the Labour Party in the UK to run their entire election on the promise of a Green New Deal. There is an international movement of young people fighting up and rising up for this kind of interconnected policy, stopping the climate crisis, building a fair economy, and it must include fair and just trade policy as well, and that's what we're fighting for. Uh, so Robin and I have some, uh, some songs and some chants uh, yes. from that period that predates me a little bit, but I've been really honored and excited to learn them and hopefully teach them for, uh, for y'all. <laughs> Okay, so in the research of the Sierra Club annals of the WTO, I found a um, Christmas carol that we wrote. Um, and Ahmed and I are going to sing it for you all. <laughs> all right, so, you ready? I, I think so. Okay. I gotta, I gotta, you better, better not, not shout. shout. You, you better, better not cry. You, you better, better not march. march. I'm telling you why. WTO is coming to town. You better consume, you better just buy. Prices are good, but don't ask why. WTO is coming to town. They hope that you're not listening, because there's lots of laws at stake. But if you raise your voices, you'll be club for free trade's sake. So you better step back and let them through. They've got a secret deal to do. WTO is coming to town. <laughs> and finally, one of the chants that we had back then, because we were uh, having fun with the Tea Party and the uh, rights of our, our founding fathers wanted us to have, uh, the chant that we, that we marched in the streets with, no globalization without representation. So join with us. No globalization without representation. No globalization without representation. No globalization without representation. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Robin and Ahmed, for being here. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce Rhonda Ramiro. She's been an organizer in the movement for national democracy in the Philippines since the 1990s. Rhonda was the founder of Bayan USA in 2005, establishing the first overseas chapter of the Philippine Philippines-based New Patriotic Alliance, a nationwide multi-sectoral alliance of over a thousand grassroots people's organizations in the Philippines fighting for national and social liberation. Rhonda is currently the chair of Bayan USA, a member of the International Coordinating Committee of the International League of People Struggles, and a member of the Administrative Committee for the United Nations Anti-War Coalition. Please welcome Rhonda. Let's make some noise out here, warm ourselves up, make some noise. Woo! I'm so honored to be here with you today on this 20th anniversary of the Battle of Seattle and the, uh, the, the um, victory that was won by the people to shut down those talks of the WTO back then. Um, the alliance that I'm part of, Bayan, uh, Bagong Aliansang Makabayan, we were part of something called the People's Assembly Against Imperialist Globalization, which helped to bring over 300 people from around the world to participate in those protests. Those 300 people from around the world were linking in solidarity their particular struggles in their countries against the neoliberal offenses dictated by the WTO and others in their own countries and protesting together against this common enemy with people like you in the streets of Seattle. So while the manifestations of this neoliberal agenda in their countries may have looked different, so for the farmer in Kenya, or the assembly line worker from the Philippines, or the indigenous person from Mexico who all came together, the results they knew of this neoliberal offensive, which had been taking place in their countries for decades, have been devastatingly the same. So poverty, lack of food, land theft, monocrop plantations, violent bosses locking workers in sweatshops to work for 12 to 16 hours a day, dangerous conditions in their workplaces, union busting, and economies in free fall. 
So their consciousness of the problems in their countries and the need for international solidarity of people struggling against a common enemy brought them to the streets of Seattle in 1999. Out of that mobilization of people from around the world came the International League of People Struggle, which I'm a part of in 2001, which continues to organize people on these many different concerns in their different countries, but knowing that the common enemy, US imperialism, through the neoliberal offensive continues and that we must unite together to fight against it. And that legacy lives on today. I can see it out there here with all of you, people in different generations, from different parts of the city, from different countries originally, maybe from different states, all together united, knowing that we do have a common enemy. And that 20 years ago, while we shut down the streets of Seattle, the, the fight didn't end there. So these movements back then, that which came together, uh, linked together in calls that are just as relevant today as they were back then. So upholding people's sovereignty, Making trade serve the people and not the corporate elite. Ending trade liberalization. Attaining mutual benefit in international trade, not one-sided agreements that benefit the corporate elite in the US to the detriment of the farmer in the Philippines or the farmer in Kenya or steal the land of the indigenous person in the Philippines where I'm from or the indigenous person in Mexico. We don't want just a renegotiation of policies that the WTO pushes and other neoliberal uh, economic institutions. We don't want them to keep pushing migration for so-called development. We want real fundamental change. We reject more tax cuts for the monopoly banks and corporations. We reject the bailouts. We reject the subsidies. We reject these gilded contracts for corporations while the workers of all these countries suffer. Higher rates of unemployment. And while the people are rising up in resistance, we are also seeing a new wave of fascist repression coming into town, right? To try and crush us, to try and stop us from being here, to try and stop us from mobilizing the, in the streets. Definitely this is happening in my home country where we have one of the most notorious fascist presidents on the planet right now. I'm sure you've heard of him, Rodrigo Duterte. Yeah, boo. So Rodrigo Duterte didn't come, rise out of a vacuum though. You know, he's um, one in a long line of puppet presidents that have told the line of encouraging more US corporations to come in, to build these so-called public-private um, partnerships, which, you know, aren't unique to the Philippines, uh, which I think, you know, many people here are probably familiar with, you know, because they've been brought to other countries as well. These so-called public-private partnerships, which actually just make flexibilization of labor. So ensuring that there are no labor protections and make it as easy as possible for corporations to come in and abuse the workers. For the uh, ability of corporations to come in and steal the land from indigenous people so Duterte is per trying to uphold the status quo, uphold the ability of these corporations to come in, and especially US corporations, by waging what he calls the war on drugs, which has led to the killing of over 30,000 people, and his so-called war on terror against activists, against people standing up against the status quo, against people like us who are in the streets fighting against these uh, poverty politics, against people like the farmers that I met over the summer who were trying to take back the land that uh, a mega plantation had stolen from them decades ago, against uh, indigenous people whose uh, cities have been bombed, whose schools are being occupied, whose churches are, or places of worship are being occupied, and whose own little towns are being occupied and militarized and turned into intelligence gathering outposts for the Philippine military to be able to spy and then crack down on people who are just resisting, like you and me, this onslaught of neoliberalism. And President Duterte is doing this with the full backing of, of Trump, with the full backing of corporations like Dole and Del Monte, like with the full backing of corporations like Chevron, whose interests are in the Philippines to explore, to exploit, to extract, and to continue to ensure that the Philippines remains its neoliberal, I mean, I'm sorry, neocolonial uh, subject. 
Um, but just as you know, we're commemorating here the 20th anniversary of the WTO, it gives us a good time to pause and say, let's reflect back on what that 20th, that what we achieved here 20 years ago. We shut down the, the talks of the WTO. We brought to the world stage that people in the US really do care about this um, notorious institution, which is reach, wreaking havoc on countries like the Philippines and others across the globe. And you know, I coming from the uh, the Philippines, we're the people who brought you people power in 1986, which toppled a dictator, Marcos, back then. But just a year and a half later, after the WTO in 2001, we also brought down another president, Estrada, another corrupt president who was similarly a puppet of the United States. And today we know the people are fighting back and we're resisting the dictator Duterte and we are gonna take him down too because we're continuing to carry out that legacy of people power. We're continuing the legacy of the power of the people in the streets of the WTO. We know we're gonna be able to, to resist the fascist onslaught. We have to. We're gonna take down the president in the Philippines. We hope to see the same happen in other countries like Brazil where we have another fascist dictator, even in places like Japan, industrial and superpowers themselves or powers themselves. And we hope to see the same happen here with the continued resistance building in the streets to end the system of corporate globalization, imperialist globalization, which is wreaking havoc on so much of the world. So I say in the spirit of international solidarity that the Filipino people are with you as we were 20 years ago when we brought others here to this country to say we are one with you in the struggle. International solidarity is the way to the liberation of the world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Uh, I am pleased to introduce Jim Page, who's going to share a song he wrote about w the WTO protest called Didn't We? Um, Jim is a local musician who was named one of the 50 most influential musicians in Seattle history by Seattle Metropolitan Magazine. Page has recorded 21 albums, toured 13 countries, and covered songs by the Dewey Brothers, Christy Moore, Michael Hedges, and more. Please welcome Jim. Are we, are we okay? November 30th, 99, history walking on a tightrope line, big money pulling on invisible strings, getting into everything so deep. It's hard to believe it's in the food and the water and the air you breathe and the chemistry, the biotech, the banker with the bottomless check, the corporations and the CEOs and the bottom line as the profit grows, the money talks, you don't talk back. They don't like it when you act like that, but didn't we? Shut it down, didn't we? November 30th, 99, it was a Tuesday morning when we drew the line. It was a WTO coming to town, and we swore we we're going to shut it down. And they stood there with their big police. They had the National Guard have to keep the peace with the guns and the clubs and the chemical gas, but still we would not let them pass. And they raised and roared and their tempers flared and there were bombs bursting in the daylight air and they'd run us off to us in. But we came right back again, didn't we? Shut it down, didn't we? November 30th, 99, millennium passing as the numbers climb and the people came from everywhere. There must have been 50,000 out there. There were farmers, unions, rank and file. Every grassroots has its own style. There were great big puppets, two stories tall. There were drummers drumming in the shopping malls. There were so many people that you couldn't see how that many people got into the city and the WTO delegates too. But we were locked down so they couldn't get through, didn't we? Shut it down, didn't we? November 30th, 99, lockdown at the police line and they're hitting you with everything they got, but you ain't moving, like it or not. And they're tying your wrist with plastic cuffs and they're loading you up on a great big bus and they're taking you down to the Navy base. 
pepper spraying you right in the face. Try to break you down, try to get you to kneel. But you got the unity and this is for real. And they can't break a spirit that's coming alive. That's the kind of spirit that's bound to survive. Didn't we? Shut it down, didn't we? Now the media loves all the glitter and flash. The newspaper's talking out a whole lot of trash about the violence of the people in black and how the cops are so tired they just had to attack. And the secret's hidden in that deep dark hole of what they call City Hall may never be told. The mayor's out doing the spin. The police chief quit so you can't ask him. Well, they can swear to God and all human law, but I was there and I know what I saw. And the visible stains that wash away in the rains, but this old town will never be the same. Didn't we? Shut it down, didn't we? Now it's the greatest story ever told. David and Goliath, how you be so bold. Standing up to the giant when the going gets hot, and all you got is a slingshot. Well, they tell me that the world's turned upside down. You gotta pick it up and shake it, gotta turn it around. Take it apart to rearrange it. I don't want to save the world. I want to change it. Don't let them tell you that it can't be done. Because they're going to be the first ones to run. Just take a little lesson from Seattle Town. WTO and how we shut it down, didn't we? Shut it down, didn't we? November 30th, 99. so much Jim yeah. <laughs> next this morning we'll hear from Manuel Perez Rocha who led the effort against the MAI the multilateral agreement on investment in Mexico he's an associate fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington and so and an associate of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam He's a Mexican national who's led efforts to promote just and sustainable alternative approaches to trade and investment agreements for two decades. Welcome, Manuel. Thank you. Good morning, Seattle. Thank you, Washington Trade Fair Coalition. I'm gonna start doing a, a little strip tease here because I didn't know it was gonna be this cold this morning but I found this beautiful t-shirt yesterday at a pharmacy and for $9 I said, why shouldn't I wear this today? Especially <laughs> Seattle, the city of inclusiveness. So I may freeze a little bit here, but let me say, and as Laurie said, after 20 years of defeating the WTO here in Seattle, uh, stopping the introduction of the so-called Singapore issues like ISDS because that was intention then to have a multilateral agreement on investment under WTO rules and that's one of the things we stopped. However, today we have 3,500 or so bilateral investment treaties that apply and enforce ISDS. 60 years ago, Pakistan and Germany signed the first bilateral investment treaty. This agreement paved the way for a glut of dispute settlement and arbitration systems and other appendages of the so-called trade policy, because it's not only about trade, it's about enforcing investors' rights. Uh, and only six months ago, this country that signed the first free uh, bilateral investment treaty with Germany, Pakistan, was hit with $6 billion, a $6 billion fine for allegedly infringing on the profit-making opportunities of a multinational mining corporation. 
This fine was leveled by an unelected three-person court within the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, you know, ICSID, which is part of the World Bank Group, and one of the many such enablers of unchecked corporate power unleashed 60 years ago. So it is clear that these trade and investment policies no longer even benefit the signatory countries, but rather line the pockets of global elites at the expense of ordinary people and the planet we share. Backlash to these policies has peaked, but has waned also. It peaked 20 years ago here in Seattle with the protests against the WTO, but they again re-emerged, you remember, in our fights against the free trade area of the Americas that we also defeated, the FTAA, and also against the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Many other fights have been won, but it is clear, you know, that as the right wing has increasingly taken up opposition to trade policies from a protectionist and often xenophobic angle, the need, the need we have to distinguish a left internationalist critique of corporate globalization has never, never been more urgent. The chauvinist policies of Trump and its imitators around the world like Duterte, which was mentioned by our colleague, are, need to be strongly condemned. But if the progressive movement is simply reacting to the neoliberal trade agenda and its right-wing disruptors, it is unlikely to achieve many meaningful change. So I think progressive politicians and policymakers, from Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in my own country, Mexico, to Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, etc., they must unify, unify around a progressive vision of trade and guide an international system that places people and planet over profits. That is why a bold new vision for international economic cooperation and global, global development is so crucial. We, organ, many organizations, have been working on a document which is drawing on the rich history of trade policy alternatives, and we have developed a working paper. It's called Beyond NAFTA 2.0 Toward a Progressive Trade Agenda for, planet, for the People and Planet. Here it is, another world is possible. You can Google it. You just put Beyond NAFTA 2.0 Institute for Policy Studies, and it'll come up in English and Spanish. So this paper articulates four key pillars for a progressive trade and development agenda. And it, it, is not a, it doesn't start from zero. It draws from years and years of people from all over the world working on alternatives. It says it's a working paper, and we have to continue working on it. So in our framework, trade and investment are regarded as means to enhance material and social well-being not ends to be pursued at any cost. Existing trade and investment agreements and proposals must be judged. We propose four pillars, which are not exclusive of other proposals. First, human rights in the broadest sense, including economic, social, and cultural, and environmental rights, must have primacy over corporate and investor rights. And there needs to be legally binding obligations on transnational corporations. Second, democratic governments must have the policy space to pursue and prioritize local and national economic development, good jobs for their citizens, and the preservation, promotion, and restoration of public services. Third, citizens, communities, and the environment have the right to protection through public interest regulations. Fourth, a climate-friendly approach should be adopted whenever pursuing trade and investment which can no longer be allowed to outpace the, the carrying capacity of this planet. Yeah. Only by securing these principles will we achieve true cooperation. Only then will we establish the base for a broad public interest in a more egalitarian and ecologically sustainable system while ensuring fair and prosperous international trade. The progressive trade agenda outlined here is forward-looking and aims to mobilize urgently needed international efforts to address the intolerable levels of inequality and the existential threat posed by rapid climate change. Thank you very much. Let's go on.
Well, good morning, sisters and brothers. My name is Larry Brown, pronouns he and him, and uh, it is my honor to serve uh, as president of the State Labor Council and serve the over 600,000 union workers in the state of Washington and the over 600 locals. And uh, 20 years ago, I was on the stage at WTO, not as a speaker, but as one of the people in the orange caps that were supposed to help keep order. And uh, the person that I'm going to introduce, and it's my honor to do so, uh, I just heard uh, was one of those people that I was looking out for because he was out making trouble. Uh, but I want to acknowledge my uh, co-chair of the Blue Green Alliance, Robin Everett. Uh, it's so good to work with you and it's great to have a real leader like you. So thank you. Now, the uh, executive vice president of the uh, AFL-CIO, Tefari Gebre, uh, he was elected in 2013 and became the first immigrant political refugee, black man, and local labor leader, local uh, labor council leader, elected as a national officer of the AFL-CIO. Tafari has, con yes, thank you, give it up for Tafari. Tafari has continued to demonstrate leadership by example. For example, being out here in the rain in this morning uh, with us all. He has focused his attention on building relationships between labor and community groups, immigrant rights, democracy, and racial justice organization. Based on his own experience as a child refugee, Gebre has brought a passionate and personal perspective to bear in the labor movement's fight for a comprehensive immigration reform and a pathway to citizenship for millions of immigrants uh, here in America. In, in that end, it is uh, Tafari's experience as an immigrant labor leader, activist, advocate for racial justice, and grassroots and local labor council leaders that we count on in the labor movement in the United States to show us the progressive path. Please give it up for Tafari Gebre. <laughs> Good morning, Seattle. Good morning. Now, 20 years ago, um, as Larry said, I was here at a life-changing moment, a life-changing couple of days here in Seattle, as you demanded we deserve a better world. We deserve a world that values human life as bank accounts. That's what we were doing. That's what Seattle did. And I wouldn't want to be any place else today than be here with you. That's why I traveled from Washington, D.C. to come and stand with you guys today. <laughs> Brother Larry, thank you so much for all the work you do in leading the labor movement here in Seattle. It's as vibrant as it has ever been. And it is, uh, it's because of you and leaders like you that we have a strong labor movement that realizes that we just don't live to work, but we work to live. And we are rejecting, starting here in Seattle, the false choices that the corporations give us. Either we get a good paycheck or we breathe a good air. We demand both and we will get both. Brothers and sisters, Seattle 20 years ago happened five years after NAFTA. Five years after American workers got ripped off of their rights. Five years after a Democratic administration signed one of the most morally bankrupt trade agreements that has left American workers and Mexican workers and Canadian workers in the dark. Brothers and sisters, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. But Seattle, I am here today because 20 years ago, you set the tone. 20 years ago, we learned the lessons. 20 years ago, you gave us the backbone. And because of that backbone, we indeed have been making progress. 
sisters and brothers, it was the spark that started in Seattle that became the vehicle to defeat one of the largest trade agreements, corporate trade agreements in TPP. Donald Trump had nothing to do with it. You defeated TPP. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Lori talked about a turnaround. A turnaround. And I was sitting, standing right there and thinking about what does a turnaround look like? What does it mean about turning around? We will know we turn around when we arrived on the notion of assured prosperity, when we arrive on a notion that every worker and every child and every, every human being in the, in the face of the earth matters, not just corporate accounts. Brothers and sisters, in order to get there though, we have to pay attention to one thing, because they know how to divide us. They know how to push us down because they don't meet, they don't just rally, they conspire against all of us. By they, I mean the large multinational corporations. Right now, they are going after our basic democracy in this country. They are, they are trying to buy it with cash money. Brothers and sisters, None of this matters if we don't have our democracy. If we don't have our democracy. They call it critical infrastructure legislation. They call it this, they call it that. But what they want to do is they want to stop us from taking over the streets and shutting it down like we did 20 years ago. And we have to be aware of that, brothers and sisters. We have to be aware of that. Our democracy cannot be for sale because the minute we lose our democracy, we have lost our basic humanity. That's what it is. So sisters and brothers, I know I come from the AFL-CIO, so you're probably wondering, what is the AFL-CIO doing about NAFTA 2.0? And how we see it. We are not against trade. We want trade that lifts everybody up, not lifts everybody down. As we have been saying for a long time, it is trade is a choice. It is like walking into a building and pressing a button on an elevator. You have a choice. You can press down or up. We want trade agreements that take us up, all of us, not push us down. And if this administration wants to deliver on the promise that the president made of fixing our trade agreements. We want rights to our Mexican brothers and sisters who toil in factories. We want wages to rise for Mexican workers. We want corporations to be responsible for polluting our waters and our air. When that happens, we enthusiastically will support any kind of trade agreement. Until that happens, we'll fight it like we have killed TPP. We will kill any trade agreement that comes along us. And that happens not because labor wants to. That happens when we come together like we did on TPP. When the consumer community, when labor, the environment, and the clergy, and students, and the world comes together and says, enough is enough, like we did in Seattle 20 years ago. Brothers and sisters, I am proud of you. I am proud of you for standing in the rain today. But our work is cut out for us. Our work is cut out for us. And I want to see you in the streets. I want to see you in the precincts. I want to see you in the protests. Let's go. Let's fight. Uh, this world is ours. Let's march for shared prosperity. Thank you so much. Yeah. Weren't our speakers awesome this morning? Yeah. So we are going to do a five block march to the federal building. Uh, Russell, will you wave your hand? He's over there. We're going to line up behind him, and he and Cody are going to lead us on the route to the federal building. Um.